Good morning. I drank some extra coffee this morning. I know, some, I know some of us, maybe all of us, are kind of worried about the slickness out there, so I drank a little bit of extra coffee. Uh, but at the same time, it's important for me to share what the Holy Spirit has led us to hear. I'd like to share a story with you. Former boxing champion of the world, George Foreman, shared a story in 1974. He was on his way to Africa to fight Muhammad Ali. George says a friend of him gave him a Bible to take with him on his trip. said, here, George, take this Bible with you. This Bible will give you good luck. So George thought about it, and he was like, well, the only time I've really read the Bible or heard about the Bible is realizing it was just a shepherd's handbook, probably because the only verse that he's ever heard was, the Lord is my shepherd. So he said he was always looking for good luck, so he carried that Bible with him along with his lucky penny and all the other things that he carried for superstitious reasons. So he went to Africa, and he lost the fight. When he lost that fight, he threw the Bible away, never to open it one time. He said, well, if the Bible can't help me win a fight, how can this book help me in my life? He thought he'd get power. He writes, I thought I'd get power simply from owning this book. I didn't even realize that I need to read it and read what it says. George Foreman later on says, since then I've come to understand that the Bible is my roadmap and not my good luck charm. It is great to be with you this morning. I thank you all for venturing out. And this morning we're going to begin a journey. We're going to begin an adventure, uh, something I'll call a trip of a lifetime. You see, in the past we've focused on certain books of the Bible, certain topics that we've dealt with, such as the book of Ephesians, the book of Acts, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, the book of Job, the book of Colossians, heaven and hell, finances, and on and on, the things that we've looked at over the last few years, focusing on just one book, focusing on just one topic, one specific thing. But today, starting today, instead of diving deep into just one subject, we starting today, we're going to change things up and we're going to look at things from a grand perspective. We're going to take the next few weeks and look from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to look at it all. You know, when I, when I used to live in Alaska, when I had time, when I wasn't working, I'd try to explore, find some new places to go, some beautiful things to see. And you can discover a lot of things just by driving off and getting lost. I'm sure a lot of you have stories that we don't have time to share about that. So I would do that by myself. I would just drive and get lost and find some beautiful things. But every now and then I'd come back home, I'd fly back home here to Baltimore, and it's totally different from 35,000 feet. You know, right there on ground level, things are beautiful, but it was so much, to me, it was so much prettier from way up to see all the mountains from 35,000 feet. And so that's what we're going to be doing starting today. We're going to discover key truths, major events, main themes found throughout the entire Bible. This morning we're going to, be, going to begin our study titled, The Redemption Story. Our new series is titled, The Redemption Story. Maybe you hear people asking you questions, or maybe you've asked questions such as, what does the Bible mean for my life? Just because I'm a Christian, that doesn't mean I have to read the Bible, does it? Then some people say, is the Bible really relevant in our world today? Well, the answer to all of those questions is yes, yes. And yes, the Bible, like George Foreman says, is our roadmap. It's our handbook for life. It's a mirror. It is a light. It is God's love letter. This is God's love letter from his heart to mine, his heart to yours. And starting today, we're going to look at these truths, these themes, these topics. And when we look at them, we have to start at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The very beginning of the Bible is where we begin our journey today. It's the story of the creation, something we've studied in detail, if you remember, 
in the past. And so this morning, as we begin our redemption story, we discover the truth. The truth. Something That's something that right there is being thought over. The truth of a biblical creation. This morning, we're going to see that the creation story found right here in God's holy word. This is true. This is fact. In our world today, there is an epic battle going on. There's a battle going on to push anything that has to do with God, anything that has to do with the Savior, Jesus Christ, out the window, out the door. Our world is pushing evolution on us. Our world is pushing personal happiness instead of biblical holiness. So as we focus this morning on the, this first truth of a biblical creation. There's two points, simply two things I would like you to leave with today. And for most of you, most of us, these are probably obvious things. But maybe we'll be rejuvenated today with the truth, number one. The key point is we need to realize, we must realize that we have, you and I, we have a creator. The person walking outside over there, over there, they have a creator. The very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, says, in the beginning, God created the heavens <coughs> and the earth. What is this verse saying? What is this trying to tell us? It says, in the beginning, God. Our universe is not eternal. The Bible doesn't begin by saying, in a land far, far away. It says, in the beginning, God. That means there was absolutely nothing but the Savior. There was nothing but God. Hebrews chapters, Hebrews chapters 10, or 1, verses 10 through 12 says this. It says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will, wear, they will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same. And your years will never end. Everything built in that Bible on your lap this morning, everything in here is built around God. Why is that important? Why is it important that this book is built around God? Because God is the one who formed the earth. He is the one who created it. He is the one who owns it. It belongs, it all belongs to him. Now at times we think it belongs to us, don't we? Maybe it's just me but it belongs to him. When God created the world, there was no time involved. When God created the world, he didn't need matter or energy. There was no thousand, ten thousand, millions of years. No, seven literal days. He was first, and everything else was second. David, in Psalms 19, verses 1 through 4, says this, says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour, forth, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. I don't know about you, but I personally cannot describe well the feelings the peace I have knowing that I have a loving God, that I have a loving creator that cares about me, this sinful man, that I have a God who loved me and created me. Take a moment and try to think about life without God. Try to think about a life without a God. As difficult as it is to leave our Christian worldview, Join me, try to join me, and imagine your life without a creator. You see, life without God now means you have as much worth as anything else. Survival of the fittest, right? That means I now, without God, I now have as much worth as the ant, not in here, (laughs) the ant outside. I have as much worth as my dog laying at home right now. I have as much worth as the worm walking across the sidewalk. 
They all have as much value. Without God, they have as much value as life. They have as much value as I do. When you believe in evolution, you're losing your self-worth. And on top of that, we now have no purpose. We now have no reason. Without God, we have no reason for living. I don't know about you, but I do not know one thing about my great-great-grandmother. Great, great, any of my great, great grandparents. I don't know one thing about that. You know what that shows me? That shows me if we are just here by accident, if you are, if you and I are here by chance, we are four generations away. Some of us, maybe you say three, from being forgotten. Never to be named again. You think about that? Without God, you lose your reason for existence. Without God, there's no such thing as right or wrong. There's no such thing as good or bad. There's no absolute truth. There's no moral law because there's no moral law giver. I encourage you to take time. Whether you know it or not, we're talking about the topic of apologetics, something I'd love to read about, love to study. So I encourage you to take time, read books by C.S. Lewis, read books by Lee Strobel. Both of these men were devout, I probably shouldn't use that word, but devout atheists. And they were like, you know what, i, I got to see if there's any truth here. And so they studied and studied and studied. And at the end of the day, the end of years really, they said all the evidence says there's a God. All the evidence points to the fact that a God does exist. We're going to watch a video this morning. It's a two-minute video. Lee Strobel, Strobel can say way better than I can. It's a two-minute video that's going to talk about his journey from being a strong atheist to a strong theologian. Let's watch that video. Well, we may not, we are not watching that video, but there is an awesome video. And that that video, um, we may see if we can get it for later, but that's okay. That's um, Alex, just let me know. But uh, that, now I'm going to ruin it for you. <laughs> but it's a two-minute video sharing about how his wife started going to church, became a Christian. And then the, he's like, uh-oh, I have to leave her. Because he was like, our worlds will not collide. Our worlds will not get along with us having two totally different viewpoints. And now he went to church just to check it out one day. And he said, if what that pastor said has any credibility... That has a huge implication on my life. And he searched and searched and searched. And now he's one of the greatest um, minds of apologetic thinking. He's the one who writes The Case for Faith, The Case for Christ, all those books. It's him. He's an amazing man. He also shares the theory of evolution. He says this. He says, the theory of evolution has failed to explain how a non-living chemical can somehow leap and become the first living cell. There's absolutely no evidence of the gradual evolution that Darwin predicted. Cosmology, the study of the universe, has proven that our world has a beginning. Like I said before, our world is not. Our universe is not eternal. That reminds me of something I don't know about you, something I read in Genesis chapter 1. Biochemistry, DNA, astronomy, physics, all the scientific data points proves that we have a creator. Again, this gentleman, Lee Strobel, says this. Says, in other words, science, when done right, points to God, and more and more scientists are coming to that conclusion. The more scientists peer into microscopes, peer into telescopes, they're concluding that the fingerprints of God are surrounding us. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 says this. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We have a creator. We have a creator. Each one of us has been uniquely shaped, created by God. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Does that, you know what that means? That means you and I have the breath of God himself in your lungs right now. The scary part to me is what am I going to do with that? Tabernacle Baptist, we have a creator, but it doesn't end there. Since we have a creator, that means the second point I would like you to leave with today. And that means you now have 
a purpose. We have a purpose. Let me tell you this story, which I hope is funny. There's a uh, truck driver who was on the road bringing 500 penguins to the local zoo. But halfway there, his truck breaks down. So he sees another truck driver going by. So he waves him, flags him down, waves him down, and says, hey, buddy, will you take these penguins to the zoo for me? I'll give you $500. So he jumps on the opportunity, takes them to the zoo. So the next day, the first truck driver got his truck fixed. So he's heading into town for his uh, next delivery. And what he sees when he gets the first light in town, he sees the second truck driver walking across the street. And right behind him are 500 pen penguins just waddling across the street. So he's like, what in the world? He jumps out of his truck and he says, what, what are you doing, buddy? I paid you $500 to take these penguins to the zoo. And so he said, we did. We had a great time. And we had so much money left over, now I'm taking them to the movies. He didn't get his task, did he? He didn't realize the purpose of what he asked him to do. Christian author Tony Campolo says this. He says, there is a desire in every human being to do something of worth that will have lasting significance. He says there's a longing in most people to do something that will make life better for others. You and I, we have a task that God designed specifically for you, specifically for me. Not one other person can, can do it. You were created exactly the way you are, your skills, your talent, your personality, exactly the way you are. You were created for that task. God wants you to do something special. God wants you to make a difference. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Now, a lot of people, you hear verses 8 and 9 constantly. Great two verses of Scripture. But you can't read those without reading 10. Let me just, just read 10. Ephesians 2, 10 says this. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this verse. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we, that's you and I, we are his, that's Jesus, his workmanship. And then it continues on saying, created in Christ Jesus. Why were we created in Christ Jesus? What does it say? For good works. You and I were created by God Almighty for good works. What's that mean? You have a purpose. I have a purpose. The verse continues on saying, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. God created. It is not we just have a purpose. We have a purpose from God. I have a purpose from God. You have a purpose from God himself. You are not an accident. You aren't a random group of cells that wound up here by chance. It's scary to me that while we have a purpose, while we have a task, a reason for living, there are still Christians today who are just getting by. There are still Christians in our world today that are simply existing. There's a quote by Arthur um, Pink. Arthur Pink says this. He says, the Christian life is a life that consists of following Jesus. Simply put, what does our life consist of? Following Jesus. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, once gave John Scully a challenge when he was trying to pull Scully away to help him join his company. Scully was the president of Pepsi-Cola. He was trying to get him to join the Apple team. So he says, Job says to him this, he says, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water or do you want a chance to change the world? You know, God has given you and I that same exact challenge. He lays it out in front of us and says, do you want to spend the rest of your life doing things that won't matter a week, a month, years from now, or do you want a chance to change the world? The Apostle Paul once told some of his friends, he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Paul understood that God himself gave him a specific task to complete. As we start this journey through the Bible, we begin with a very highly controversial, well not for me, but in our world today, it's a very highly controversial topic. Something we cannot get away from. This topic is in your face whether you like it or 
not, and we must remember this is a serious topic, Pastor John MacArthur once said this. He says, Scripture, or I'm sorry, everything Scripture teaches about sin and redemption assumes the literal truth of the first three chapters of Genesis. If we wobble to any degree on the truth of this passage, we undermine the very foundations of our faith. What is he saying? He's saying these, everything is built on these first three chapters of the Bible. Everything is built on this being true. Biblical creation is our foundation. If this truth we're talking about, if this point we're talking about today crumbles, it all goes with it. Everything else we study will continue to fall. We start this redemption story today declaring that we believe in this biblical view of creation and we reject the theory of evolution. You know, there's three major gaps or problems with the evolutionary theory. Now, I said three major, there's others, but there's three major problems or gaps with the theory. The first is there's a gap between nothing and matter. Second, there's a gap between matter and life. And third, there's a matter between life and human life. They've yet to come up with answers. They are trying, but they've yet to come up with a true, correct answer to these problems. But, Tabernacle, let me tell you what does have an answer to those questions. It's this book right here. The Bible deals with every one of those problems. How did we get from nothing to matter? The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did we get from matter to life? The Bible says in Genesis 1.21, so God created every living and moving thing. And how did we get from life to human life? Genesis chapter 1.27 says, so God created man in his own image. The Bible answers every question that these so-called smart scientists cannot figure out. Why? Because they're taking God out of the equation. And God is the equation. Creationist, Ken Ham, great, great man, Ken Ham, he once said this, he said, evolutionary scientists need to understand that we are taking the dinosaurs back. He says, this is a battle cry to recognize the science and the revealed truth of God. And I love that, that we are taking the, I don't know about you, I love that quote. It, it isn't exactly what it is, a battle cry, to recognize that we are taking the dinosaurs back. Biblical creation is supernatural. It goes against a long evolutionary process. You see, God didn't need, as I said before, God didn't need matter. He didn't need large amounts of time. He didn't need energy. He didn't need anything else to prove that biblical creation is a fact. It is important. This is an important truth because it identifies you and me. It identifies who God is, who man is. It identifies the basis of the gospel. And if you dive in real deep, it explains death. It explains suffering. It tells us all about Christ and redemption. As we close this morning, we need to stop. We need to stop and recognize the importance, the significance of beginning this story, the beginning this redemption story with a bold statement that we collectively unite as a church family, recognizing that we have a creator recognizing that we have, you and I have, a purpose. A statement I've heard, many of you have heard before that I love, that I think fits perfect here. That's the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God, science proves in the beginning, God was there. But as we close, I don't want you to forget that as we're going back today, as we're beginning a journey today, don't forget that he is still here right now. You know, he's, he's right here in, in the Old Testament. He's right here in the New Testament. But he's also here in our, with us today. His presence is here in this room today. And you know what he's telling you and me? He's saying, I love you so much. He's saying, I love you so much. He's saying his, his book, his book, this holy Bible, is a Bible filled with love letters he's written just for you, letters that he's written just for me. And while we begin recognizing and believing that we have a creator, beginning that we, realizing we have a purpose, don't forget. Don't forget, here in a few weeks, we're going to see that we have a savior that loves us. And not just in a few weeks, today. Remember that you and I have a savior that loves us. You have a savior, you have a redeemer, you have a king, you have a creator that thought of you, that thought of me long before this world was ever Formed. 
you and I were in the mind of God. That's love. I pray as we leave here, I pray as I challenge and try to challenge you that you walk out these doors encouraged, rejuvenated, maybe challenged to remember and realize that you have a creator that loves you and you, 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 me, we have a purpose. And that purpose isn't from your pastor. That purpose isn't from your friend. That purpose is from God himself. And I pray today that you are working on fulfilling that purpose. Let us pray. Father, this morning we come to you today, and I just thank you for each person who's here as we gather as a church family on this uh, wintry, messy day outside, dear Father. And I just pray that you will help us to remember that, Father, you have a purpose for us. You have a calling for us. You have a task for us. You made us exactly the way we are to fulfill that job, Father. Rejuvenate hearts, Father. Encourage hearts this morning. And if need be, Father, break. Break our pride, Father. I pray in a few moments that we go into a time of invitation that if there's one person here, one person here does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today will be the day of salvation. I pray, Father, if there's one person here who needs to turn back to you, that today will be the day where they leave the things of self and grab hold tightly, Father, to the things of you. Father, use this time mightily. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.